what happened to so, the notes? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, the then I clicked on something randomly and then the notes went weird. So I was like, it just I'm about to click on them. Is there a picture of Marquez Brownlee there? What else? And Linus Tech <laughs> Tips? <laughs> yeah. Maybe just. Uh, uh, hold on, see. I did Control Z, so I, I may have. In oh, version, you copy pasted um, from YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads. This is the only podcast that features three people called Shane, Mike, and Connor. Um, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> speaking of which, I'm Shane. I'm, I'm Connor. <laughs> hey. Hey. Had to happen sometime. Um, today, uh, Mike, uh, you've been learning Dash, which looks very, very nifty, actually. Uh, yeah, it's a um, it's a Python library that helps you build uh, web-based interfaces, basic websites, uh, mostly for data analysis with with no need to do any JavaScript at all. I mean, I have nothing against JavaScript, but you can create really rich website just using Python and not have to learn any JavaScript, even though the whole thing is obviously output as HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I love any sort of uh, analytics library. Um, it's always fun to play with. Um, uh, my, I, I have some news, but it, it's not really Linux related at all. At all. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I said this last episode, but I got a cat. So me and my girlfriend got a cat. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, she's lovely. Her name is Lily. Um, I can put a picture on Twitter, on my Twitter, if anyone really wants to see her. Um, Just keep her away from water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. God, I'd love a mogwai. Um, but uh, yeah, she's lovely, and that's my news. So I haven't really been uh, doing much else other than just staring at this like little tiny, cute, furry animal walking around my house, and <laughs> it's just we we don't even watch TV anymore. Um, Connor, you were under the weather though. Yeah, uh, li- qu- quite literally, because um, this past weekend was was a storm, Dennis or whatever they. Desmond or one oh, something with really the yeah, Dennis, Dennis, the Dennis, Dennis or Dermot or whatever the fuck they called him. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was some something beginning with D anyway. And um yeah, so I was I was out in this in Dublin City Centre, out in the in the wilds of it, and I think that effectively gave me like a four day dose. Uh, I was very tempted to call in sick and into work, but I decided to tough it out and uh yeah, last couple of couple of nights have been pretty rough. Uh, I I think even on Sunday night I think there was kind of even like trippy kind of fever dreams and everything like that so it was pretty bad. Uh, but it seems to be I'm, I'm I don't know if you can hear it on my voice, but I I think I'm I'm slowly getting out of it. Yeah, I guess it's the time of year. Um, I just can't wait for sunshine. I just I don't know. The older I get, the more I want sun. Like I I never used to give a shit about the summer when I was in my twenties, but um, yeah. Nowadays, I'm just like, oh, it's dark. Oh, it's always so dark. Um, so, uh, first up, before we go any further, um, we just want to give our ad read this this uh, fortnight, not week, <laughs> to uh, the EDRI. So that's the uh, European Digital Rights Initiative. Um, and I suppose by extension, Digital Rights Ireland, which is uh, one of the constituent kind of uh, organizations. Um, So they're basically an advocacy group that uh, fights for kind of a more ethical internet, you know, against, you know, they fight for uh, internet users' privacy, against corporate and government censorship and surveillance, um, basically the civil liberties of the internet and of technology. Um, As we all know, as technology becomes more useful, it also becomes more abused. So... We always need, play, uh, you know, organizations like this that are kind of out there, you know, f- fighting the good fight and making sure that uh, people who don't have as much knowledge about the dangers of these technologies are kind of protected and they're spoken for. So it's very important that these agencies and uh, organizations and NGOs, etc., keep going. 
So uh, if you can go to edri.org, you can donate to them or you can go to digital digitalrights.ie if you're closer to home and uh, you can sling them a donation or even help out in any way you can. So first up, we're going to go to our news. Um, first up, really interesting one. Uh, hope it, it lands and keeps going into, into the future. South Korea is possibly switching all their government IT over to Linux, all their, their computers. This was planned for a while. They basically know they have to stop using their Windows 7 installations and uh, they want to, I guess, save money on licenses. Uh, I think I've heard uh, on uh, out on a podcast somewhere that uh, it's also possible that they are just trying to squeeze Microsoft for a discount. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it was in... Uh, I think it was on... Uh, uh, Linux actual news or somewhere where I heard it anyway. Um, I just imagine a corporate guy from Microsoft going, "Hi guys, I can totally give you a discount." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they uh, they priced it out. They uh, moved to Linux, and it's not going to be cheap. It's going to cost them about six hundred million euros. So that is, uh, but still probably cheaper than buying all of them, all of the Windows licensing li- licenses, or I don't know if they'd need to buy new computers. This is obviously nowhere near finished. Uh, they started talking about it, uh, I think, mid last year, and they are uh, probably going to, if they are going to go ahead with it, they are going to spend the whole of this year uh, probably to working on, to working on it. So uh, hopefully... They'll see. Uh, hopefully, they'll see it through, and uh, there will be one uh, freer government in the world. Yeah, it's, it makes a lot of sense. I'm just reading the quote here by their uh, the head of their Ministry of Strategy and Finance. He said, "We will resolve our dependency on a single company while reducing the budget by introducing an open source operating system." And uh, it's an aspect of this that I had never even properly appreciated was that. Uh, if I, it never occurred to me, obviously it's staring you in the face, but you never really think about it, is that you're basing your entire country's IT on a single company's product. And when you think about it, that's mad. Like, um, Yeah. So I guess it makes actually, it really does make total sense for them to move to a system that, you know, everybody knows how to fix and maintain and stuff, you know? It, like nothing's proprietary, nothing's locked in. So you have choice as well. I find it funny that uh, like the most prolific, the two most prolific computer systems and the two most prolific mobile uh, phone systems, operating systems, are all American. So every country in the world is dependent like like, like a lot on this one country and on uh, whatever they do. I mean, uh, you know, you can uh, you can say maybe that the United States have been historically the force for good. I don't know. I'm not a historian. But I'm just logically that's not a very good state of affairs. Now Linux is obviously also run from the United States, but it can be forked uh, if need be. It can it can be uh moved. You can you can have a as as you said chain, you can have your copy. So uh in that sense I'm really actually it's more surprising that more governments haven't seen this and uh, like a long time ago because Linux, Linux has been ready for like government work for, for ages, right? There might be, uh, you know, I don't want to deride what they do, but uh, that's a lot of computers doing the same thing. So they should be, uh, they should be, well, actually, no, I'm probably wrong. It's not a lot of computers doing the same thing. There's a lot of computers doing very many things, but still, I'm pretty sure it's been doable for a while to uh, to put all their infrastructure onto Linux. And uh, having having uh, you know, seeing looking at it uh, through the through the depend- dependency perspective, it's really interesting that most countries don't actually uh, choose their uh, choose to run their own operating systems. I mean, like you know, you have always the famous. Uh, famous examples of North Korea having their own Red Star Linux and uh, Russia running, trying to, I think, run uh, or, you know, support Yola as an, or Sailfish as an operating system, if I remember correctly. And you have the failure of Munich that uh, that's always tossed into our face when we talk about how good Linux is. But, uh, you know, it's it, it should be more prolific and I can't wait for the Irish government to adopt, um, I don't know, some kind of a Linux 
Zorin, probably. <laughs> I think that 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 like uh, going back to what you said uh, about the the failure of Munich that they always throw in our faces like that was a that was an implementation problem you know that was a strategy problem so like I know I know you know that but like um, but yeah that's that's what people don't understand that was that was a problem with how it was done not with the software there was a problem with that as you said that's i think a big chunk of it but also that opened the door for people who didn't like linux and uh maybe were very favor favorably uh looking at microsoft that opened the door to them to uh, basically change it over there so it's it's definitely uh, by uh, a lot of a lot of Microsoft efforts directed in that way as well. It, uh, uh, the, I think the you know the the fact that uh, the politics there changed and that they built a new headquarters somewhere around there or a regional headquarters for Microsoft uh, that definitely helped uh, to put things back uh, in in Microsoft's favor. So, like the problem with a private company offering uh, governments uh, software and, and kind of enticing them in, um, and uh, Connery said earlier about discounts, you know, like get the discounts in, and it's sometimes with Linux it can't compete on that level because what you could find with some of these companies is that they might actually be cheating themselves out of money just to get just to get the contract. They they might be slashing their profits or doing it you know below cost or something just to get the contract just to have that into the future so linux can't compete on that level because anybody who's going to go in and implement a linux system for them any contractor who comes in and helps them to do it they don't have that power to go below cost or to take a hit on the profit or anything also it's um it's a politically courageous decision. Uh, like, if you put Linux on, I don't know how many thousands of clerks' computers and something goes wrong, they are going to be, oh my god, this new Linux thing is complete shit. Like, why do we have to put up with this? If they have Windows on there and something goes wrong, they'll be like, yeah, well, computers are shit. We just have to live with it. You know, so uh, that, that's, that ties in into the saying that no one's ever... Uh, you know, no one, no one, no politician has ever going to be fired for giving money to Microsoft because that's the standard, right? Or, or, or also because they're paying them the big bucks. You bet that there's a, a telephone number that they can shout down the the telephone line at because their users are saying, uh, "Oh, this op operating system is not running well." Yada yada yada. We deserve something better. Yada yada yada. That's what enterprise contracts are. The reason why you pay them the big bucks is because no matter no matter what, there'll always be some sort of escalation point. Yeah, so that by the token, though, you would probably, if you wanted your local implementation, or then you would have to look to another big company to get that level of support, right? So you are talking at least Canonical or Suze or Red Hat. Well, I mean, at least those are the biggest uh, uh, companies uh, that could offer support for support for your uh, Linux desk, uh, installation. And I don't know if Red Hat does uh, desktop support. I don't. I literally don't know. Uh, I think Canonical might do it. I don't know. But uh, it's uh, if you you know you there is a danger that if you try to get it uh, locally or if you try to if you basically try to get it at all, you might end up like Munich because. That level of support that you mentioned, corner that just might not exist in the Linux desktop world. If they wanted to roll out servers, yeah, sure, um, they could they could get any amount of companies to do it for them. But uh, desktops, I'm not. I don't know. Uh, uh, this is me just speaking off the top of my head, but I'd imagine uh, Red Hat has workstation builds um, that she, that they would essentially your your office computer is uh, air quotes a workstation, so they would have workstation. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, sure they would have desktop support. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was actually joking before, but coming to think about it, you know, when I said Zorin, they this is what they are trying to do, right? In uh, oh no, yeah, yeah. In they have got, they are trying to put this Linux desktop into institutions, organizations, companies. So, if if the Irish government ever wanted to do this, actually, they would be the the choice. I don't know if they are able to do. I, you know, I government don't. Cover, I cannot but. ever see the Irish government doing this because, well, not like never, but not in the near future anyway, because. Um, just how shit works here. It's all about 
it's all about contractors and you know the path of least resistance with the with the Irish government. They 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 tend to just go for the company that gives them the smallest invoice, like basically, or they they I, bid I, the lowest. I, so I say they, they're going they're going to freaking legalize weed before we get freaking open source. Sort of oh, for the, sure, the absolutely. Um, uh, but uh, especially if Sinn Fein get in, but uh, <laughs> but um, the uh, so the like. Like how I would do this is like I've thought about this at length before because it just it boggles the mind why they don't do it this way. But I know the reason: money. Like fucking money ruins everything. Um, profit. You know, increasing your numbers, your growth, your MMR, your MRR, or whatever the fuck. Like, um, but uh, like this ruins good shit all the time, and I'm sick of it. <laughs> and it's like, but uh, the, the, yeah, how I would do it basically: you get some company that's good at what they do. They canonical. Let's just say canonical. They come into the government. They set up. You know, I'm head of procurement or whatever in the government. I say, right, you come in. You we have like a fucking six to twelve month or eighteen month transition period where there's like intensive training, but you're basically training government employees to be the internal support for the government. So they're basically on a set contract and they're working themselves out of a job. So they're they're teaching the the the, the, the civil servants who will be administrating this to be self reliant or self sufficient at the end of it all. That's not going to work for two reasons. Uh, one is, as you said, well, no, you, whoever you certainly have longer term support as well available as a last resort for sure. Yeah, they they would be literally, as you said, they would be, uh, you know, working themselves out of a job. Secondly, I think modern governments are, as you guys said as well, all about contractors. So if you if you can buy a contract, that means the next time you are short of money, you can just disregard the contract. You hire yourself a bunch of civil servants. Next time you're short of money, you still have a bunch of civil servants. I don't know how it is in Ireland. In some places, you can't really, you can't really, you know, uh, make them redundant. So once you have them, so uh, in those countries, obviously, I think this is pretty much the case, or at least has been the case in Spain, for example, or uh, other places. You, if you, if you, so maybe some governments prefer contractors for that matter because it's e they are easier to. Uh, you know, uh, stop paying, or you know, they are, once the contracts through, you don't have to choose to pay again. You you have to keep in people employed if you once once you have them in some cases. Well, like mm -hmm. companies like Red Hat, they sorry, uh, com companies like Red Hat do work on a support model. So I I don't I don't see how you know the the, the software itself isn't really the point. It's the support that you're paying for. Yeah, what I was going to say is. Uh, that without getting into too much details, I can tell you 100% that a lot of uh, state bodies and semi-states and ev everything like that 100% outsource their IT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe the Green Party, once they are in government in some few years, will do it, do it differently. Yeah. Oh, they have been in government. <laughs> um, and they, 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 got, they got run over roughshod by the majority party. Um, Shambizzled. Yeah, exactly. They're only now starting to approach their. Anyway, where it's not a politics podcast, um, <laughs> <laughs> which we keep reminding ourselves. Yeah, we keep saying that, but you know. <laughs> yeah, but there was just an election in Ireland for those who don't know, and you've probably read it about it in the papers. It was some big historic uh, kind of surge. I hate that word. They keep using the word surge, but uh, it's, it's the surge anyway. Sinn Fein got way more seats than they ever have, and they're matching the two oldest parties in the country now, and it's like. <gasps> <laughs> and, and, uh, it's like, and nobody wants to get into bed with the other person so they're they're all at a standoff going I'm not going into government with you so it's there, at the moment it's a bit of a Mexican standoff between they're, three parties they're basically all just posturing for the inevitable next election in two months time um, <laughs> so yeah because it's a hung doll or a hung parliament uh, if you're in, in Britain um, but uh, or uh, I don't know you, do you get a hung congress Probably not. <laughs> no, they don't. They, I mean, hung down. That sounds like something that you get from, uh, you know, from your ice parlor or whatever, uh, as a, as a, that's on the takeaway menu. Uh, uh, but I'm sure they get. No, they actually, the American system is. I don't think they get. They get. They get a stupid thing that the president is basically in opposition to the to the parliamentary body, like it's. Uh, 
like Obama was in his last year, last years, wasn't it? Like that they, uh, yeah, did the, re- they, the, the Republicans the, had both houses, so they basically strangled yeah. everything. Let me see. Okay, let's move on to the next piece of news. Uh, Connor, uh, you put one in uh, an app center for everyone. Uh, this is the folks behind Elementary OS, and they have launched a Kickstarter, which they've already blown through. Uh, the, at the at the time of this recording, they're at one hundred and thirty four percent of their of their flexible goal. Uh, they had a goal of, uh, I'm sure it's coming up in in as a as a uneven figure because I'm viewing this in euro and it was at, it's probably an even figure in US dollars, but uh, their goal was uh nine thousand two hundred and fifty nine euro was probably so ten thousand dollars ten thousand dollars, but um. Essentially, what they they want to do is they want a their app center that they've been developing for elementary OS and to essentially have that point t- towards uh, flat packs, which it currently does, but make it more distro agnostic. Um, also, it, um, bring in a more robust payment system, so the payment system like you could. In theory, you could install this on Manjaro or Fedora or something like that, or or regular Ubuntu, and then your 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 payment system would just be seamless. Your everything like that would just be seamless, um, which is it's a lofty goal, and just, uh, they they're not exactly asking a lot of money for it. But I think the and essentially what their money they're looking for is to do a sprint so they're all going to meet up in person and they have a breakdown and it says uh, this is what we think we're going to pay for food this is what we think we're going to pay for lodging and travel and like fair play to them like they've 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 done their research and they're one, being 100% transparent and they're saying, giving their breakdown and saying we expect this amount to be paid for taxes which is like as usual, a large chunk of it. Uh, this of uh, this amount for food, this amount for travel. They have a, a a pie chart breakdown and everything. So fair play to them. And it's 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 um from the mock ups, it actually looks pretty good. It's essentially like this is where you put in your credit card details, and it looks all cool and nicely designed, as as a lot of things um uh from elementary OS do. So. Uh, uh, encourage people to check it out, and you might even get yourself a nice, um, cool mug or hoodie with their their nice designed logo on it. Wow, that's a uh, that's a really cool project. Yeah, I've never seen this before. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. I might even, I might even back it actually. Uh, <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, definitely check that out. Um. Next up, uh, I noticed today, uh, I saw an article from uh, about a week ago, um, I noticed OpenShot Video Editor has gotten a uh, an, a major update, so they've added quite a few uh, cool features. Um, OpenShot, uh, obviously, Video Editor, um, how it would compare to others is probably slightly less features than KDN Live. Um, KDN Live would be probably the you know, the Adobe premiere of Linux, and that's kind of stretching it a bit. <laughs> um, but uh, Open Shot's a little bit more like iMovie. It's a bit more straightforward and simple, but I like it because, um, I don't know, it's, it's it's not super stable and it hasn't got a ton of features, but um, with these updates, what I'm reading, it sounds very promising. Um, so uh, just to go through a quick overview of like what what's been added so it's got like hard experimental hardware <laughs> acceleration um which is kind of essential in a video editor like it's it's a bit ridiculous not to have that um one cool thing is it can open final cut pro and adobe premiere f- pro files which is really cool actually that's very interesting um so uh <laughs> so they haven't apparently fixed the stability issues uh, because it's not super stable um a lot of the video editors don't tend to be crazy stable. Kden Live's not great on that front either, to be honest. Um, so, you know, save file recovery is what they have implemented. So, so it's not necessarily fixing the stability, but just giving you a bit of a bit more of a safety net. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. They've added other kind of random things, like uh, they've improved the keyframing system. Um, I can't really comment because I've never really used keyframes in any big way before. Um, and uh, there's uh, a Blender integration, which I really need to read more about. I didn't actually have time to read it, what, what exactly that entails, but that does sound very interesting. Um, because Blender 2.8 is sick. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'd be very interested in that. Um, you have to get it from a PPA though, because, or, or an app image directly from the site, um, because it's not in the repos yet. That's an older version, but, um, yeah, I'll definitely give it a whirl. So Mike, you, you, you've brought us sad tidings, uh, essential who make the, uh, the essential phone, uh, are ceasing operation. They're the essentially dead. Oh, oh my god <laughs> i was trying to say quickly something before you figure this one out oh my god anyway yeah uh they are essentially dead jim and uh, the problem of the, pro the thing was that essential was meant to be the the phone that kind of would make sense to people because there's no there's no shit on it put put on by the operator there's no shit on it put on by the manufacturer uh you know it's a decent version of iGrowth that and um, it's a decent version of Android that gets updated regularly on time, and uh, the phone is slick. And they were made. They basically wanted to produce more. They never sold much of the first. They never sold much of the first one, and uh, yeah, they just probably ran out of money. They had some cool things uh, in the works, as they show on the like post mortem trailers that they put on the or post mortem promo videos that they put on their website like what could have been and stuff but uh yeah you know um it's it's sad but uh i i know like what the most popular phones are uh roughly because that's the kind of statistics that i work and uh across at least the across the part of the world like western europe and the united states and then southeast asia like if you're not if you're not Apple and if you're not Samsung, then you can like forget it. Uh, you know, you might make some niche product, but if you are aiming to become uh, to become big, then these two companies have got such a massive hold on the market. Obviously, now with Huawei trying to uh, trying to get there, but they've been a bit shot by the by the uh, by the American administration. So we'll, so basically, what I'm trying to get to is that they tried their best, I'd assume, and they didn't uh, they didn't make it. Uh, Connor, you've had one of those phones. So what what was it like? Um, well, I still have it. Uh, at the moment, it's kind of in a software bricked uh, situation where I kind of experimented a bit too hard uh, and didn't get it. And it's no long no longer in a booting state. In terms of hardware, um, really solidly built. I believe it's actually like has titanium around the edges and like ceramic back and everything. Like really well built. Like and um, and I got it. I didn't get it when it was uh, at their launch price, which was kind of quite expensive. I got it kind of used on uh, adverts. If any, uh, probably only Irish people will get would get what adverts. Uh, adverts is kind of like. Your your online classifieds kind of like like Craigslist, but better and less seedy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or it's you know with less tree. creepy shit, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So I I got it for a steal. Uh. Like uh. Maybe a year or two after it it was released. Um. And like really good hardware. Uh. I mean they it had it's kind of cut out for the for front facing camera. Um, way before the people were coming out with their with their own versions, and even even then, despite the fact that they were earlier than than the the trend, air quotes, it, they were actually still competitive with with the with when the other manufacturers actually caught up with them. So oh, yeah, it was yeah. really it was really nice uh, cut out design for the for for it. They, and, they were um, the first to have the notch. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, w w and also, one thing I was actually genuinely surprised about was nearly always when when uh, Google announced a beta of their up-and-coming Android operating system, and they would have the usual like, "Oh, we all our all our next all our well, first it was the Nexus, then the Pixel. All our Pixel devices, they they are they're all supported by this beta." And then in a corner somewhere, you just see the essential logo, and it's like, "What, <laughs> really?" 
I was like, that thing that's gathering dust in, in the corner of my, uh, like, some drawer somewhere, that is getting the better before my, like, my OnePlus phone or whatever. <laughs> I was like, oh, better boot it up. And then, sure enough, I could sign up for the beta. And um, I think, uh, unfortunately, I, I did I did get the beta of, of Android 10 on it. And I was playing around with that, and that was really cool. Uh, but I think it was after that that I, I did my semi-bricking hijinks and but I've been informed that it actually did get the full Android 10 release after that for like full stable and everything like that but unfortunately you didn't get to experience that but um who knows um I might might be able to recover the device and get it into a semi-working state one thing I have heard and this is uh, not 100% confirmed is that they're not they're essentially essential are kind of giving a parting gift to the uh pe- the device owners and i think they're going to be releasing some of the some of the uh the firmwares or modules or something like that like i i'm i'm spouting out words without knowing actually what what they mean but essentially giving to the lineage OS community and the custom ROM community a, a way of kind of saying here here's some extra sauce that you you guys can use that you can essentially prolong the life of this device just because we're going away doesn't mean that the device cannot live on which fair play to them I'll, I'll have to say that's that's a good way of going out yeah that's cool um it's yeah it's sad to see uh, a project like that go but um you know these things happen uh hardware is a tough game it's not very easy for any company to make it uh you really have to cut your cloth to suit your what's how does the rest of that go i don't know um jib i don't know <laughs> cut your cloth to suit your measure that's it um so yeah yeah you, you really are taking a gamble if you want to come out and say hey we're gonna make a groundbreaking smartphone it's like okay have you got a spare few hundred million like um so next up uh UK UI so that's the uh that's the desktop environment for uh Ubuntu Kylan or Chillin apparently uh I was told before we started recording um UK UI or Yuki now using QT instead of GTK um Connor so from the screenshots that are on the OMG um Ubuntu article here it is looking quite snazzy with kind of frosted, semi-transparent um, look to it. Um, it's kind of reminiscent of uh, Windows 7 in terms of layout. Uh, well, a, a lot of things copied the kind of Windows 7 layout, but it's it's their own unique take on it to a certain extent as well, so it's, it's not a direct copy of it. And also they have their expanded... Um, uh, menu a la gnome as well so for people who are more familiar with that it's it's looking quite quite good and quite snazzy and um fair play to them for doing a like the first off they started off with a, a fork of mate so that's what they're using before and now they've completely changed that and they're now changed it over to being qt based so fair play to them <laughs> they must have some some rather um talented developers over there so fair play to them. Yeah, it looks, it looks, it looks nice. I mean, I'm not a big fan of the Windows Seven look, but uh, I'm sure people who just want the familiarity of it will uh, appreciate the effort. And uh, it's good that there's somebody sticking out for them, you know, in the design world. I uh, would prefer the dash, obviously. I would have to try it, but I think the distro is in Chinese, so I don't think I'd be able to. Uh, like. But uh, yeah, it's it's good that uh, I like it. I basically I like it every time I see that uh, somebody's putting a lot of uh, thought and effort into making Linux uh, not just glitzy and pretty, but also like very much usable. If it doesn't matter if it's uh, if it's a Windows Seven categorical menu or if it's just a better if it's just a better terminal, you know. But uh, uh, this kind of uh, approach to to your users that's always welcome i believe there is an english translation but i do not know how extensive it is because um i think i was using i've i tried out uh well if it's based on ubuntu could you not use 
just the Ubuntu localization. Yeah, that's that's true. That's fair. That's for, very true. I'm looking at the pictures in uh, on the OMG Ubuntu on the article, and they seem to be in uh, in English anyway. So, yeah, my... that, that's fair. No, that was just my my response to you saying. Uh, I think it's in Chinese. I don't know if I'll be able to yeah, use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good time to learn, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow, that that would be an effort and a half in my old age. <laughs> old age. It's not really old age anymore. It's more like yeah, pre, no, the, pre, uh, pre pre uh, middle age. Almost <laughs> for almost forty is the new fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, uh, this is uh, fairly recent news. Um, we've just uh, been reading about the, the new PC gaming platform where Linux support is not optional, writes Jason Evangelo of Forbes. Um, so this is a new game distribution game distribution platform, um, which uh, looks uh, looks a lot like uh, GOG. And, but it's apparently going to be in completely open source, completely Linux based, uh, which is interesting. Um, they've launched a Kickstarter a crowdfunding campaign for uh, $50,000. Um, yeah, I mean, looks uh, interesting, I guess. What, what about you guys? Well, so they try to, their USB is basically, they are trying to be DRM free, as you said, open source, and I think exclusively Linux only. Which, uh, you know, DRM free and open source, those are great goals. I think the exclusivity for Linux there is probably just to make sure that uh, that the developers of the the game developers support Linux Linux at all. Uh, it's 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 a, it's a noble noble goal. Uh, I think judging by the logos, it's also meant to be written in Rust, which is a plus always. Um, they have raised uh, so far sixty five euros out of the forty six thousand five hundred and eight euros that they or fifty thousand dollars that they that they uh, need. Uh, they say I think that uh, it's gonna take about two years for them to put it together. Uh, and I think from the from the get go, their biggest issue is not going to be to get people on Linux. It's going to be to get the game studios to publish the stuff there, because it's always the biggest problem. Why there are no people on Linux? Because there's no apps. Because the people who make apps don't make them for Linux. I mean, that's by and large not true anymore, as much as it used to be. But still, this is going to have this kind of an issue. So. Uh, obviously, we put a link in the show notes uh, to both the Kickstarter and Jason's uh, Jason's article, but uh, uh, it, it's something to look out for. We, I think, we do need a, a good extra content delivery platform. I mean, obviously, Steam is Steam, and Steam did wonders for Linux, uh, but something just for open source DRM free games would be would be wonderful. I think there's a parallel to what uh, the elementary folks are trying to do with their app center for everybody. Uh, you know, they are also trying to get developer published to people on any distribution, but also to get developers paid. And this is the similar principle. Like, you know, if you are a game studio, publish your game here and people will pay pay you for your games on Linux. So uh, noble effort. Hopefully it will work out. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the, as you might see in the article, there's a few tweets from uh, various people who are quite skeptical. And one of them was actually from Nick, who was on the show uh, recently. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're showing a bit of skepticism here. And I'm inclined to agree because it's, I mean, I, lo I would love it if it succeeded and we had something like this and it, you know, reached the levels of, of success that they're hoping for. Um, but... I am skeptical about the plan of action, you know? I mean, they have a pie chart breakdown here of the 50 grand that they're going to raise on Kickstarter and 23.6% for security and penetration testing. Uh, that uh, That's just over about like 10 grand of the 50. Then like 15% server marketing, 15% 15, 15 for uh, developer outreach. Or no, sorry, that's additional resources. Um, but yeah, you're talking 15% of... 50 grand is what like seven grand or something i i'm just guessing here i'm just i'm, I'm just doing some head maths here um head yeah, maths. Yeah, yeah. seven point <laughs> five thousand seven and a half thousand i think yeah so most of the like that's those all seem like very low amounts for what they want to do um 
and and then hardware is is even less it's like it's what three grand three or four grand on hardware for a company that wants to make a game distribution platform that's that's like one gaming pc yeah that's one gaming pc <sighs> that's uh, that's probably yeah i can see where the skepticism skepticism is coming from but um you know uh you never know apparently the uh the creators or the what do you call these people founders um i guess are talking to people on on reddit so if you guys have any questions there's uh in jason's uh, article there's also a link to the reddit or subreddit uh, where, where this is going on so you can are, raise are they doing there. an ama <laughs> i don't think an ama more like responses but you know uh yeah okay so on to the meat in the sandwich that is this episode um we uh as you know guys we've been making this podcast since september 2018 is that right yeah <laughs> yeah to september 2018 i Actually, nearly, I nearly like did it a second time. august um august or something uh yeah and i remember it was the you know the heady days of summer 2018 you know that the, there was a good grand stretch in the evenings um you know there was leaves on the trees um and uh we were like sure feck it we we will take talking about linux in the pub or at the meetups and let's record it and put it on the internet and see who gives a shit uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um that that was the birth of linux lads and as you might have guessed today is a bit of a retrospective um but mostly uh we want to kind of uh, this is uh me speaking anyway i can't speak for you two guys but the the point of this is for me is to show that you can create content you can do something good and worthwhile and create something on linux it's it's a it's a platform for creativity as much as you know technical things that are technically interesting as well you know so um yeah, that's that's kind of what I get out of Linux, as I've probably mentioned before. But um, but yeah, so <laughs> I'm just back to the days. That, you know, when we first started, it was totally different. Um, you know, we had our we the very first episode. I remember we were gathered around one USB mic attached to a laptop, with the fan going, and Mike typing on the laptop <laughs> on the table, which had the microphone that we were all speaking into. <laughs> and uh, so uh yeah we've come a long way since then so that was that was interesting in in, in connor's dining room um it's like how, how are we going to get rid of the 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 background noise and the echo connor bring out the feckin tells <laughs> yeah and it was only like three or four months later that i even realized noise reduction existed in audacity um <laughs> so uh yeah so th like that that's that's the one thing the kind of then and now and how how fast has kind of shaped how we do things and improved our lives in general or improved how we do the podcast anyway and audacity is a huge one like when i first started using audacity i was doing it ass backwards like i i had no idea what i was at um and just the little tricks and bits and pieces i've learned over the years and well months well it's not a multiple of years yet it's 1.8 years i guess <laughs> 1.6 years maybe <laughs> um and uh yeah that's just i just find it really interesting the evolution of it and you know how i was just kind of blundering my way around audacity and just saying that ah, sounds fine and it actually didn't sound great at all and uh having the volume levels that went went like peaked up here and then went really quiet down there and everyone's saying yeah you why are you shouting in one part and whispering in another um so just that that's how he speaks in real life <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and uh mike and your interesting solution for um, a recording booth in your old apartment. Oh, yeah. I had, uh, we bought a fridge and uh, the fridge was very tall and big. So I thought that I will improve the quality of my sound by basically putting the, fr putting the cardboard the fridge came in into the hall and putting chair inside it and a table inside it, my laptop inside it. So I had basically a recording booth, booth uh, made out of old 
<laughs> wrapping cardboard and i don't know I, f- I i put some towels over it to dampen the sound and it i think it might have helped because back then i was living in a flat that was basically on the one of the busiest roads in dublin so day and night there was and the windows in the flat were appalling like no insulation at all single glazed so uh there's obviously there was a lot of noise in that flat and uh, i think that the uh that the uh big what you call it uh that the big cardboard box helped because I also had a single Yeti microphone and that thing was extremely sensitive. So that was, I think, before I got uh, a different microphone, a different condenser microphone. So, uh, you know, it looked funny. It uh, was hilarious. It was extremely uncomfortable as well because I'm not a small person and uh, the the, the fridge isn't that big, so the box wasn't that big either. But, uh, yeah, it's something that... uh, uh, you know, the fond memories of the beginnings definitely are in a cardboard box. So we all, uh, well, I, as Mike was just saying, uh, so I started off with a Blue Yeti, which was the initial microphone that Shane was talking about. Um, so on the on the basis of that, uh, Mike was like, I, I, know, I know very little about microphones. Um, here, I will, I will copy Connor or whatever and does... But what do you recommend that? Okay, that will do. And yeah, it 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 worked out at, at the start. I mean, and Shane was had a a blue snowball. Um, and they're they're relative in relatively inexpensive USB microphones. You could just simple USB, just plug it into your computer. They won't work out of the box. Plugging into Linux, no extra configuration required. Um, so if you're looking for something that is simple to use and relatively inexpensive than um those type of of uh microphones um mightn't be too bad the only criticism is is because the both the microphone and the audio interface is all contained within one then there might be some electronic hum that might be picked up on a buzzing uh, that might be picked up when you're recording, but uh, your mileage may vary in that regard. Uh, obviously, blue microphones are not the only people who make those kind of microphones. There's um, Audio Technica do uh, a USB version of my microphone yeah, as well. The one I've had uh, my eye on for quite some time, <laughs> which is the AT twenty AT twenty twenty AT twenty twenty. I have the XLR version, so that means that uh, between this microphone and my computer, I have a Behringer audio interface. So I just plug the XLR cable into that. Uh, as any long time listeners will probably remember that I had a uh, Scarlet uh, Fortnite or for- Focus Fortnite. Right. Focus right <laughs> Fortnite. Yeah. Uh, Focus it- right Scarlet audio interface. Uh, my biggest criticism for that was it work was working intermittently with Linux. Uh, it was never consistent, but any time that they, it was plugged into Windows, um, fo- or Focusrite had up on their website had native uh driver that you could just download from their web page. So of course that worked one hundred percent of the time. So unfortunately, I was dual booting into Windows just to record the podcast. Um, and sometimes I'll find, hey guys, today's a good day. The 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 focus right seems to be working on Linux, so we could actually record on Linux today. And some days it's like, nope, <laughs> it's like, did not work. How's your audio interface feeling today? Is it in a bad mood? You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was kind of it. That was, and that's another thing about the. That's another thing that's, that's improved kind of massively, um, especially since I start since I started using um, uh, Ubuntu again main main line ubuntu again um the the sound issues have not been as shit for the last 6 months or so cuz i remember every time we 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 did an episode right up until like late last year we had some sort of audio issue every time we recorded like one of our sounds would drop out somebody somebody's recording would get a bit messed up in the early days and you know we I, we dealt with all sorts of crap like the amount of times i i re- accidentally recorded from my webcam mic and it sounded like garbage um was i've like, done that yes. i lost count of how many times each one of us has done that at one point or another um 
and yeah but it's it's fine like it, it was cool because you know you got the experience of fudging around with audacity to try and make it sound as not shit as possible um <laughs> so and it's gotten to the point now where you know um i, I was going somewhere else with this story i promise but it kind of went off the rails <laughs> um so yeah but the, the so in summary um focus focus right bad burned your good yeah <laughs> linux on audio Linux on audio or audio on Linux, uh, C minus, maybe C plus nowadays. Well, it's actually I I am not being fair. It's actually been okay lately. Uh, and a a little more peek behind the curtain. What we're actually using to have an old chin wag with each other. Uh, not for we're not recording it, but it's just for the sake that we can kind of a video chat amongst ourselves. Is uh, Discord. And that was another thing that I can't say how many freaking times that the the lads were all ready, raring to go, ready to record. I'm like, lads, I'm just hearing crackle. I can't, I can't stand this shit. I'm just hearing crackling back, coming back. So that whole thing about audio support in Linux, um, it, and it seemed to be just for, uh, Discord and, um, up until quite recently, I mean, it was only in the last couple of months that Discord or whatever upgrade happened in the background just seems to be more reliable now. But in the past, it was completely and utterly hit or miss. And we've tried various different things, including Google Hangouts, which I know is is, is either has died or is on its way out. Uh, Jitsi Meet does various different things. P- people have suggested various things, both paid and unpaid. Uh, or by, by unpaid, I don't mean that we're going to pirate it. I mean that it's it's free and open source. Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, but at the, that's just what we're using at the moment, and that might change in the future. And uh, we use what works. Um, uh, whether it's ideally it should be free and open source. But obviously, Discord is not. But if it works and is reliable, we will use it. If a free and open source. Uh, an open source uh, alternative comes up that is uh, just as reliable or even 90% as reliable uh, and maybe doesn't have all the features. I mean, we don't use half the features that Discord seems to have. Then obviously we prefer that. So that is a semi shout out to anyone on Twitter or who wants to email us if you want to suggest alternatives. Yeah, the, 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 that's the thing. Like, um, I like we've ne- we've always had the discussion of should we always default to a free and open source program, you know? Should we, you know? And generally, I think we do, but as in in so far as it works on a practical level, um, well, it's kind of hard, right? So if you if you are talking about a text editor and uh, you are to- you are thinking, well, if I'm going to use this open source, I mean, text editors are actually the the open source are, ones are the best, but let's say that you had to spend an extra second or two here and there using the uh, text editor for whatever reasons, but and that that would be okay in most cases to just you know spend the extra effort. But if you are talking about something as uh, like that doesn't that needs zero latency or as low latency as possible as video chat, then it kind of has to work because it's more of a binary thing. It either works or it doesn't work. So that's why you c- there's not much wiggle room if it doesn't if it, because if it doesn't doesn't work, then it properly doesn't work. It's not just a little bit fucked. It's completely utterly foobar. So or as good as you know. It's true. Um, and it, like what I was saying earlier, it's very interesting how the <laughs> I know we 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 beat the dead horse on this a bit, but like the 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 level of. Uh, professionalism in general in every aspect of the podcast how that's changed over the first since the first episode is is kind of crazy but you know it's 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 been a process it's it's kind of been really satisfying actually to 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 see it kind of go from just kind of crackly audio and kind of us kind of going uh uh what do we say next and like and uh to to kind of the slightly more polished thing that I, I'm I'm very proud proud of making, you know? I mean, um we for for anyone who's a naysayer, we actually do give a shit about about the final product, the fact that 
that if it that it sounds okay that I mean that's the reason why we've we've changed our microphones we've changed our uh, going from USB microphones to ones with like uh, burned your audio interfaces and got more expensive microphones which um, I was going to say hopefully sound better they do sound better because I've heard the fucking difference <laughs> but uh, no but our standards have, have raised as well sure we we, we uh, still dick around and we still uh, curse and whatnot and what whatever but we there there is, has been a journey and we have raised our, our our audio standards as well but the joking around and giving each other flack I mean that's all part of the term that's that's um, in a way that's our USP is the very is our interaction with each other uh, as well as the uh, the content that we we go through like the news and the dis- discussion and the guests that we have on uh, which is great I mean I love fucking love having the guests on it's really interesting yeah I can't believe we've actually ever had some of those people on <laughs> <laughs> Those are people whose podcasts I was listening to way before we did this. And that's that's very interesting. Um, but uh, just to move on to kind of more of the software that we use and how we do things and stuff, because um, uh, I think that might be interesting to some people out there. Um, so I think personally, and I'm going to be a bit very, very flattering to Mike now, but I personally, I think the most impressive thing about this podcast is the machinery in the background that publishes it and all the server stuff that Mike has waved his magic wand from Diagon Alley and <laughs> says, says he just waves his wand and, and a podcast happens. Oh, not at all. So not can at all. you this ex- is all... take us through that a little bit? Cause I find it fascinating. Yeah. I, I, well, thanks for your praise, but this is mostly thanks thanks to the like uh, vast and rich expanse of the op- open source community and the open source landscape. So, uh, the website that's uh, that runs on a CMS called Graph, which is a flat uh, flat uh, file CMS, which basically you write a markdown you know, file, put it in the right place. And uh, there's your there's your web page, or you can. It has got an interactive da- dashboard, millions of different teams and plugins. It's nowhere near as big and clunky and uh, possibly uh, full of holes as uh, as uh, WordPress. But uh, and it does like Shots most fired. of the thing. Yeah, I know. Right? But it does it does a lot of things. And uh, like if you it you know you can you can if you if you're into tweaking web 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 frameworks like this one's definitely one to look at. Uh, in the back end, uh, there's uh, basically a bottle which is uh, similar to Flask, basically Python server uh, that runs as a service. It takes uh, it takes the show notes file that's written in Markdown with all the emojis and everything, and outputs it a to uh, puts it basically into the proper f- folder for the website, and it also using Jinja uh, Jinja two uh, templates, it creates or puts together the RSS feeds once for uh, one for the uh, what you call it uh, MP3 and one for the OC file, uh, and uh, we have a form that we type the show notes into. I mean, we use uh, you know we we copy and paste the links there, and uh, there's a test site where we test it first, and that's written in Vue.js and it's connected to the Python backend. So, like. That's and that all runs on digital 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 ocean droplet on a, uh, again droplets. that on <laughs> yeah that all runs on a digital ocean droplet. I mean uh, those things are amazing. I think it's um, I'm pretty Hashtag sure it's not sponsored. Yeah, we are not sponsored by them, uh, they, but uh, you know this is the five dollar droplet and it does everything we needed to do. And uh, you know we've been storing all of the audio files are there. And it's still nowhere near as nowhere near full, and it uh, you know all the bandwidth that we need is provided. So like that's a lot of that's a lot of uh, value we get for our five dollars plus tax. Uh, and, and, and in fairness, if yeah. you make a good product like that, you deserve yeah. you deserve to be talked about a lot. That's how it works. Um, yeah. So in summary, Mike has worked fucking hard on this website. So fucking visit it. You- <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's all, but it's all thanks to like open source product projects. Like if there wasn't Python, for example, 
we would have to do this in PHP, and that would be a pain, at least for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, like, I, I, I don't want to go into too much detail on my end of things, because that could take a while, but... Um, if anyone's interested in how I edit the podcast, you're free to get in touch with me on Telegram. You'll find my username in the Telegram group. Um, uh, or I could say something about it in a different in a YouTube video. I don't know. Do a screencast. Who, if you're interested, let me know. I'm I'm happy to help. But um, yeah. So the the on the publishing side of things, it, it's it's that's where the fun comes in for me because gotten so used to audacity that uh i can kind of you, when you cross the threshold from using a tool from basically clicking things and hoping it works to knowing what you want and knowing what to click to make that happen you know <laughs> so i think that's the, the the precipice that you go over when you when you finally become ah okay i know how to use this for the most part so that only occurred for me in the last year or so where i was like I had the thing, I, wa I wanted it to sound a certain way in my head and I wanted it to flow a certain way and then I could click the right things and then that happens. And like, that that sounds small, but <laughs> it's it's huge when you're talking about uh, a program you've never really used before and have never had any audio training of any kind. So yeah, that's uh, that's always a nice feeling. Um, but the uh, we did actually publish on YouTube before, but personally... I found it was a lot of effort for not much in return because we got very, very few views on it. And the only real interactions we got were people who uh, who thought our stance on Brexit were, was wrong or some shit. I don't know. There, there was one person, uh, inf there was an infamous person who literally uh, listened or listened slash watched to that one episode which was an interview episode started criticizing the um or interview method and saying you should have asked them this you should have asked them that you should have asked them this and uh but that was the only episode that they've ever listened to so i, th yeah. I would think his response was like well try to get a, a feel a feel of uh of our of our style kind of that we interviewed the person in our style so if you didn't like our style then um maybe go to one of the other uh, umpteen other linux podcasts that that person has been interviewed on <laughs> so for those uh who are at all interested in how we make uh the podcast um definitely give us a, a shout on telegram um the like uh, what what I would love to do, uh, as I said earlier, what would be to actually publish some video stuff on YouTube, not the episodes, because I don't see the point. To be honest, um, you can listen to them on Spotify, you can listen to them on iTunes, you can listen to them on Stitcher, whatever the hell you want. Um, so you know you can get the podcast in a lot of places. It doesn't need to be on YouTube. Pocket casts, or just freaking going onto the web website and getting the RSS. But I was actually interested in doing a YouTube video on the Linux Lads YouTube channel um, with actual video. So just do a screencast of how I edit the podcast because um, I've seen some Audacity tutorials online and I think a lot of them kind of miss the point. Um, not to criticize them unnecessarily, I'm just saying that when I, I was looking for a certain, like I was looking for pod, like a video that shows you how to edit a podcast like not not just what buttons to click in audacity but like what you should be actually looking out for and listening for and what would actually sound better you know so i didn't really see any of those tutorials so i would like to maybe give that a crack um i think this would be actually really really good because uh, you have got the unique uh, position where you've done it if you've been doing it for a while but not too long so you still remember being shit at it and having all of the questions so yeah it would exactly. it gives you a unique perspective that you could work into it don't don't get me wrong i mean i don't think i'm that good at it i mean i just think i'm better at it than i was you know i was just going to think thinking that i'm sure joe resident at the moment is thinking much to learn you have <laughs> Um, so probably enough of blowing smoke up with each other's arses. Um, speaking of Joe Ressington, Fast Talk Live is coming up on the 20th of June. So, uh, we will hopefully be along to that. Uh, and hope to see everyone there. She'll be great, Greg. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those of 
you who uh, saw us at Foz Talk Live last year, we're sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we have something in the works this year. It's going to be a lot more fun, a lot more laughter inducing and probably make one or two of us quite uncomfortable. Next up, uh, uh, just uh, you know how to get in touch with us. Um, the socials, the Telegram, the Twitter, at Linux Lads, show at linuxlads.com if you want to get us that way. Um, if you want to contribute to the podcast, to our costs, uh, you can go to linuxlads.com forward slash donate. Um, we were tossing around the idea of a pa- Patreon uh, a while ago, but uh, we will see. So uh, if you're interested in doing that, please let us know. Um you can get us on Mastodon as well. Should mention that. Always mention the open ones. Um, and uh, yeah. So it's been a wild ride, guys. Um, I've been Shane. I've been Connor. And I've been Mike. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>